grafting. And um, this is an experiment that Rob and I worked on together. And he is going to describe his experience of grafting of tomatoes, and then I will talk about mine. What I had done is ordered supernatural hybrid grafting rootstock from um, uh, Territorial Seed because there was this wonderful tomato that I wanted to try called Boxcar Willie. Now, who wouldn't want a Boxcar Willie in their yard? Well, I tried it last year, and while Boxcar Willie um, was very prolific considering it's one month of life, um, it was, I, I decided I needed to try it again. And so what I did decide to do is plant some rootstock and then graft boxcar willy to a rootstock and, um, and to see then whether or not there's a difference um, in the resistance to disease um, by grafting the root with the plant that I wanted. So anyhow, um, that's kind of the background to the whole process and now Rob can talk about his experience. We sat around my kitchen table and tried two amateurs doing grafting. An amateur is a very accurate statement. <laughs> okay, this is the entire experience of my grafting life. I have never grafted anything before this tomato experiment. And uh, since my wife won't eat tomatoes and my kids won't eat tomatoes, I don't want to grow a small amount of tomatoes in my yard. But I wanted to do the grafting because it's, you know, an experiment. And so here we have uh, my seedlings I grew. I grew the rootstock, and I grew two types of tomato for scion use. One was a aroma type called Ranger, and the other is a red brandy wine. So I grew those until they were about stem diameter of a millimeter and a half, which was the size of the clips that Cindy had bought to hold the graft together. And you see the you see the clips here. And so I had perfect size match between the, the rootstock, the scion, and the clip. And it made the grafting process go pretty darn smooth. And I was done in five minutes. And I'm looking at Cindy saying, what's taking you so long? <laughs> So when I grafted, I trimmed all of the leaves off except for the meristem at the top for the scion, and I cut both sort of at an angle, but being so small, there was nothing fancy about my cuts. It, I, it, the first one I tried to, to do uh, a, a wedge-type graft, and it, I quickly found out this is not going to happen with this small size. A millimeter and a half was way too small for me to do anything fancy. So I did a semi-angular cut and put them together in the middle of the clip. You squeeze the back end of the clip and it opens up a little and then you, I just pushed them together and then let go of the clip to hold them together. And I thought, wow, that was easy. And, it, and I inspected them closely and it appeared they were touching well. So I thought I had accomplished the goal of good contact. And you can see, I wrote a book on each book, so I know all the details. And I had five. So I had five, I now have two, so that's a 40% success rate. And luckily, I got one Ranger and one Red Brandywine. So my, my next step, now I have since, I've transplanted these into pots, but they're still indoors and I'm about to harden them off and move them outdoors. And I and I also have the ungrafted brothers or sisters, as you prefer, of, of these. So I'm, I intend to plant four tomato plants, two rangers, one grafted, one not, and two red brandy wine, one grafted, one not. So we'll see what the life experience becomes for the plants. But these plants here are way behind the others. So it's taken a lot of time, uh, quite a bit of anxiety, and it, to this point, is not worth it. It better, it better, be, it better make a difference. But, and 
know, we'll, we'll see. And then nobody in my family is going to eat them but me. Uh, for 40% success rate, there was one other point I wanted to make. They were too small. I, I would say buy bigger clips than the one and a half millimeter and let them grow more, uh, which is more your experience. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and let you pick it from here. Yeah, this was definitely an experience. Um, I left by go. I didn't look at the size of this clip. And I just left my rootstock and my tomatoes that I wanted to graft onto the rootstock because I planted them at the same time. When you graft, you have to make sure that the, the stems are identical in width. Okay? So, um, I decided that I'm going to graft four of them. I only need one grafted. Now if you use graft, you, you, when you do the rootstock, you can't let this rootstock grow into tomato because it's going to be an inedible tomato. They're purely bred for the rootstock itself. So I had left mine grow in these pots. They're striated pots so that the roots grow down. And as you can see by looking at that particular one, I left mine go to, it was maybe a um, quarter inch in diameter, maybe a little less, maybe three eighths. And then proceeded to try to match them up. And that's when I discovered that the clips were too small. <laughs> and I couldn't, they would keep popping off. So what I had to do was wrap some grafting tape around it, um, a, a kind of a skewer to make a graft and then slide it onto the root stock. I did make a, a, a cleft cut, I mean not a cleft, but an, an actual, you know, where you, you cut horizontally and then you, sh you shave off and put it in to it for most of my four. Um, then I slid this little makeshift thing back over the thing and they have these instructions of, you know, you leave it in darkness for 24 to 36 hours, and then you grit in a high humidity environment. Well, the very next day my dad died. So I looked at these and I thought, you know, sink or swim, bud. Um, I, so I, what I had done is I, this is just some pumice. This is the, the grafted tomatoes. Put it in there, flipped another one of these over the top, cut it over, put some um, plastic from a dry cleaners over it, put it under the lights, and left for a week. Came back, and they were beautiful. So she gets 100% success. <laughs> <laughs> I had a humidity chamber. <laughs> <laughs> you know, go figure. Go figure. Um, so anyhow, now this one, which is one, which is the one I am going to use for my little experiment of, with regular box carwilli and the grafted box carwilli. And initially, he's right; they they were set back quite a bit. Um, however, now the graft is exceeding the vigor of the box carwilli. Very interesting. And in case any of you are interested, I did bring the the runt of the litter here, um, and. That will be for an opportunity drawing at the end of the presentation. Oh. Okay, now what did I do with the pointer? Here it is. Hardening off transplants. Um, do you, you want to know why they went through the grafting experiment yeah. Yeah. all together? Yeah. It's because a lot of these um, heirloom tomato varieties are not disease resistant. So this this rootstock will prevent nematodes and you know it has a list of um, things that will help you grow healthier tomatoes. So that is really cool because I have nematodes in two of my boxes, and I can solderize or I can try, try grafting. <laughs> Cindy shared her seed, so I'm going to give it a shot. Um, do you, are you familiar with the term hardening off? Okay, so so we know that if you grow them in this little idyllic little climate and then plop them outside and let them get rained on and cold and so forth that you're going to have trouble with it. 
So hardening off, everybody has their um, own uh, way of going about it, but basically, I used, to, I used to work at a retail nursery. I was a buyer at a retail nursery for about eight years. And we used to have our growers harden them off for three weeks. And they would take the plants out for an hour a day for the first week. And then the second week, they would take them out for three hours a day. And then the third week, they would leave them out all day and bring them in at night. And doing that really strengthens the plant, builds the, oops, builds the um, walls of the, the leaves, the cell walls of the leaves, and just makes them a lot tougher. This is a, a chart that you, you won't be able to read right now from here, but it tells you based on a particular plant like celery, you know, best at 70 degrees, max at 85 degrees, you should harden it off for seven days. So it gives you spinach, you know, it tells, tells you crop by crop, you know, the number of days, the best uh, op opportunity for hardening them off. Uh, the process takes one, one to three weeks. I recommend three weeks if you have the time, especially depending on your climate. If you are going from a really ideal climate to a harsh uh, situation like Ramona, um, I would recommend hardening them off for at least three weeks. Planting considerations. Companion planting. I was talking to some of you during the break about the biointensive planting, which is the way I do it, where I will combine uh, different crops in the same box. So these are some these are some friendly companions. There are also some unfriendly companions. Um, so these, like you, you, peas and carrots, do great together. Beets and peas do great together. But onions and beets might not do so great together. So be aware of a, a friendly companion when you want to start combining your vegetables in boxes. There's a great little book up here, The Secrets of Companion Planting. And it tells you what does well together and what to avoid together. But something to be aware of. Crop rotation. Probably familiar with the term of crop rotation. We rotate our crops um, each season, or like here in San Diego, we can grow 12 months out of the year. So our crop rotation is a little more vigorous than, and should be. Um, certain plants, like uh, the brassicas, some growers will recommend that you not use the same box for them for two or three years for a long time, so it's really important to pay attention to those particularly. <clears throat> the same pests and diseases can harbor and hang out in your soil for a long time. So rotating just prevents a host of problems. Mulching. Rob? I know nothing about mulching. <laughs> I know how to mulch strawberries. <laughs> Which they will soon see. <laughs> okay, what is mulch? It is not a soil amendment and it is not a top dressing. So for clarity to distinguish it from those, uh, it is for two reasons. To conserve soil moisture and to reduce weeds. So a thin layer of loose material to do that, or plastic is an option, so we'll go through some options. Benefits, so conserves moisture. Uh, it insulates, so it moderates, it, it prevents big swings in soil temperature from heat and cold. Uh, discourages weeds, that's a big motivator for, for mulching. And, uh, your weeds are competing with your vegetable crops, so that's a, an important reason. And uh, reducing erosion, if you have that risk in your in your vegetable garden, and uh, and and then all those moderating factors, soil moisture and temperature, help your transplants uh, feel less stressed once they're placed in the garden. So mulching around them <laughs> gives them a, a better opportunity to get started. And I'm told that tomatoes love straw. And, and so as a newbie tomato farmer with my grafted tomatoes, I'm going to come up with some straw and see if that's given them the best opportunity for survival that I can. And, and this is a real interesting uh, application of mulch. The silver mulch is sold in the seed catalogs. 
and maybe in the garden so I've got some over here too. Oh. And it's very reflective. So in an area where you don't have enough sunlight, you can increase the sun ex or the light exposure that your plants receive. So in this case, it was sort of a, a the least sunny area in the garden, and the silver mulch nearly doubled the amount of light available to the plants. And so the plants, the beans in this case, did very well in a darker area, which they wouldn't do normally. And, and the other benefit of a silver mulch is that the undersides of the leaves are now getting exposed to light, which will prevent certain pests from harboring on the underside of leaves. So it uh, can be very effective uh, for specific crops, and it's, it's worth experimenting with if you're that, you know, you like to experiment. And here's my strawberries. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Clear plastic mulch in coastal Southern California works best. It doesn't, since we don't have super high heat, and uh, or we don't want the, the dark mulch that will overheat the plants, and uh, and it keeps the berries off of the off of the ground. The soil-borne fungi are the big one of the biggest problems with strawberries. So uh, you reduce your problems with with strawberry fungi uh, immensely with the with the mulch. This is my first year doing it, and it's so far. Really good. Uh, some choices of mulch: uh, alfalfa, compost. You know, some of these. What's available to you is is sometimes the the best choice. Or do you plan to till it in afterwards? So you want a soft mulch that, like straw, that you can till in after the season's over. Um, uh, pine needles for the acid-loving plants. Uh, and then the plastics. I think the plastics, you know, we see them a lot in industrial farms. You drive, you know, down and, and see uh, plastic used quite extensively by, by the industrial farmers. Uh, some tips. Uh, uh, plan your use of mulch, but you need to prepare first. In, in some cases, you need to lay the mulch down first and then cut little X's to plant in those spots. So it's uh, you're not trying to apply the mulch after the planting. That would that would make it a lot more difficult. Uh, snails and slugs. Uh, mulch provides a great place to hide for snails and slugs and harbors them. So you don't want to do that if that's a problem you're battling in your in your garden. Also, earwigs and sow bugs are sort of the, in that same category. Uh, if, if you have the problems with those 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 pests. Uh, as I said, till soft mulches in. The uh, uh, using finished compost under mulches helps motivate the breakdown of the mulch over time. And you need to inspect it periodically. The we all know to keep it away from stems of plants, so you don't. In, that we, we need good airflow around our plants, so. Thick mulch around stems is definitely not going to to, to help. Um, some of the benefits, Cindy, do you have anything specific to say about using unfinished compost beneath uh, with finished well, compost? That, that, that's something that's new to me. So part I of the problem with using unfinished compost is that it is going to continue to um, take the nitrogen out of the soil, and so you want to replenish, make sure that what is decomposing is balanced by something that is already finished. And um, so that's why you would want to use a finished compost beneath it. So, so sort of the same thing about not using a bark around tomatoes, the, the, the drawing of, of nitrogen. And, and don't mulch too thickly. Uh, you want to shade the soil, which doesn't take a whole lot, and, and keep weeds down. So it really doesn't take more than, you know, a, 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 a full cover of the soil. You don't need a thick cover of the soil. Okay. But and if the one the one that was talking about inspect your mulch carefully. I used that plastic mulch, the, the silver mulch behind the garage as you saw in the bean seeds. And all of a sudden I noticed that the beans were wilting. What I didn't notice is that there were lumps underneath that silver mulch. And that was the one garden bed that I had not put 
some quarter inch hardware cloth underneath. And so I had all season, I had been providing nutrition to um, the gopher that had entered, and, and I didn't see it because it was underneath the silver mulch. So, word to the wise. Why we need IPM. I found this. <laughs> on, this was before I, I did my extensive um, uh, renovation of putting those panels around all of my garden beds. But it was a beautiful ripe tomato that I didn't get a chance at. Another reason for IPM are flea beetles. That's the one who ate the pole bean roots. The camo expert. Have you ever seen this one? Mm -hmm. This one, the, a tomato, one of the leaves was, was um, just wilted. And I looked at it and I found this entry, whoa, this entry port right here. So then I just kind of went back down the stem until I found that one. Um, and when I asked Vince about this, he was going, well, they don't usually go inside the stem. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, that one decided to explore. <laughs> they are cute as all get out, but I'll tell you, um, problems. Leaf hoppers. I found this in our the the that's one of our car. Whoa, that was one of our cars. <laughs> and and isn't that cute? It's also an omnivore. And um, the birds love being leaves and um, toward the end of the summer they can have it because I, I mean how many beans can you eat um, so anyhow but they do and there's still more reasons for IPM this one um, in particular but then this cute little bunny too many reasons for IPM and one of the things that you can these are all cultural controls these are things that um, hopefully will mean that you don't need as much of the pest management. But you choose resistant plants or, um, as we're trying with the grafting, graft onto a rootstock that is resistant if you're trying to grow something that, a plant that is not resistant. Um, so we'll see how that works. Um, then expose the soil pest to adverse conditions like, oh, birds come to mind. Um, I did, by the way, see one of our birds take out a um, uh, tomato hornworm. I didn't even know it was there. And it bit it in half and went off, happy as a clam. Uh, practice crop rotation. Uh, use fertilizers appropriately. Change planting times or harvesting times. If you know that in early spring you're going to get an aphid infestation and your plant loves, aphids love your plant, then delay putting it out until we're after that first blush of aphids. So you can time some of that. Um, and then you use good sanitation practices. Um, and then you do the companion planting um, that Johnny has already talked about. But when the best laid plans go awry, <clears throat> IPM would say that you evaluate your level of damage, determine probable cause, devise an effective solution, and of the effective solutions, as you know from the material you've read, it was mechanical controls, biological controls, and chemical controls. Okay, so evaluate the level of damage. There's tolerable damage, intolerable damage, and devastation, which is unacceptable, completely infuriating, intolerable damage. Okay, this is what I would call tolerable damage on the potato plants that I had. A few of the holes here, okay, not too bad. This has now become unacceptable damage. And it is eating way too much of the leaves and all over the plant. And this is what I would call devastation. <laughs> This is locking the barn door after the horse is out. I put that on after the devastation and should have been have put that on uh, prior to. 
Another, you know, another way to do this, and after you've decided it is intolerable, this, were, this was some butternut squash. Um, and as you can see, they're tiny little teeth marks all over them. Okay, so we determined probable cause. Here's probable cause. Now for the IPM options, I don't know if you can see this or not, <clears throat> but these are keel-backed tree hoppers. And they, oh, they are really ugly. And they have sucking mouth parts that will cause this kind of damage. Um, I found them on an iochroma, <clears throat> and shortly after I found them on the iochroma, and they come fast, um, I started finding them on the tomatoes. Same family. Um, and ended, fortunately, it was end of season. They ripped out the iochroma. There was no way to stop that infestation. Um, but knowing that it could also go to uh, the tomatoes kind of spurred me on. The mechanical controls in IPM or weeding, it's got to be done. Um, hand picking of insects, dislodging of insects with jets of, jets of water. I must hasten to add that it did not work when I tried that on the keelback tree hopper. And my personal favorite, which is exclusion. Um, this is what I, well, this is what I had done after I discovered all of that damage. Each of the beds now has one of these panels on them, if you want to come up and look at it. Um, that's the one that Rob was talking about that has the um, hardware cloth in the bottom and the plastic on the top. And I have, and then if I have things in container, I flip it around so that the plastic's on the bottom and the hardware cloth is on top for ventilation where the plant is. And um, I have found little dirty fingerprints on the plastic. <laughs> so you know they're trying. <laughs> Whoever thinks gardening is a peaceful, fun, yeah. peaceful thing has never gardened. It's war. Uh, oh my God. So we have the, the fencing as an option. That's the fencing that I have now in mind. The row covers we have right here. Um, we have individual cages, and I have a sample of the ones I use up here that how easily you can make those out of uh, excess hardware cloth. Um, the raised beds, you know, will help prevent some of the diggers from getting in. If you remember, put down hardware cloth in the bottom of them, of those beds, and then containers. Here are some more um, pictures of um, <laughs> attempts. Um, to do exclusion, and I'll tell you, for the most part, Rob is right. I've had a similar experience where I have no one has breached the um, these beds that have used those panels, and um, these others are for the flying, you know, the assault by air um, <laughs> of the moths and the the other critters. There are still more options, and one of them is to provide food and habitat for beneficials. In this picture right here, you see a lady beetle that is taking out a whole bunch of aphids um, and just cleaning them up um, as she was moving along there. Um, you can also provide uh, for the birds, this is for their nesting materials, the, um, primarily this soft stuff is for hummingbirds. And then on the far right, the picture there is growing Asclepia for the uh, monarch caterpillars and um, giving them a chance to thrive helps the rest of the garden. You can also seek certifications for wildlife habitats and sustainable garden practices. And I'm including this as an IPM because if you actually do get certification, then you are doing things that are IPM wise for your garden. Um, the Earth Friendly Garden Practices talks about providing habitat for beneficials. And um, for the certified wildlife habitat, um, that helps attract the diversity of wildlife and both the, the winged variety and just for your own amusement, things like foxes <laughs> that will show up and just turn your backyard into this humming bed of life. There are chemical control options, as you know. There are insecticidal soaps, horticultural oils, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, repellents, etc., etc. 
But I found this wonderful quote, and that is the most important thing you can do to encourage the activities of biological control agents is to avoid the use of pesticides whenever possible. Because, you know, many times those pesticides will not, not like an herbicide, say broadleaf only, you know, you can use, I mean, many things can be implicated by them. It just doesn't just kill aphids, many times the others. So anyhow, um, the IPM caveat is this. The disappointment of revelation that no matter what you do, you'll never outsmart the squirrels. <laughs> We do what we can. And now we're at harvest. So this is what it's all about. And so we've assessed, and we've amended, and we've irrigated, and we've controlled, and we've monitored, and ta-da, we've got tomatoes. So this, this is the goal. This is the goal of what we do. But in harvesting, there are some um, considerations for you to think about. If, for example, if you have a chicken coop in your backyard and you've just handled your chicken or harvested your eggs, then to go and harvest your tomatoes, you want to wash your hands on the in-between. So be, be aware of uh, gardening practices that are safe for you and your family or for school gardeners or for community gardens as well. It's important to teach them you know, safe practices for their food storage, for their um, their own benefit. So keep the tools clean in between. You can also, with your tools, you can transfer disease from one plant to another plant. I keep a little squirt bottle of alcohol if I'm harvesting a bunch of tomatoes. Rinse it off, squirt it with alcohol, then go to my next box and harvest the tomatoes out of there. That's just that's just the practice that I have. Clean your hands when you when you move from plant to plant. Uh, wash your vegetables before eating them because who knows what's landed on the plants and so forth. So make sure you keep your vegetables clean and then store them properly. Make sure that they're not um, stored in, when they're wet, you know, or refrigerated when they're wet. Let them dry out on your counter before you store them. And also, if something is overly ripe or going by, it's not going to be getting any better by putting it in, in the freezer. So if it's just gone by, return it to the compost pile and complete the circle of life. So, so um, good harvest practices are important. But most of all, we just hope you have a really, really good harvest. Um, these are some school gardeners from the Franklin Middle School during their harvest. So. We know that we want those kids to wash their hands. <laughs> we know what those kids' hands have been. But anyways, um, we'll go on to journaling. Okay, thank you very much. So journaling, so if you spent all that time creating your vegetables and you learned all these things, the journal is the chance to not forget. And so I wanted to share this book, which this is my first year with it, but it has each page of the calendar, uh, well, you can come look at it. Each page of the calendar has 10 years of history. So, for example, April 1st uh, has 10 years of opportunity for you to record what happened on April 1st. And it becomes a, a valuable history all in one place over time. So if you're the kind of gardener that, you know, spends all day doing whatever you do, and in the evening you like to sit down and, and log your notes for the day, you can become a really valuable resource to look back on, you know, yes. <laughs> what you harvested, what you planted, what, what climate issues there were, uh, all the things relative to your, your garden experience. So I've started using it, but I also wanted to share... That's why we have two! <laughs> How's that? Yeah, is it, there it is. This one working? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in addition to the journal, a uh, simple spreadsheet for seed starting is often, you know, a, a great way to see what sprouted, how well it sprouted. If you keep track of soil temperature when you sowed, how long did they take to come up, and what's your harvest? period from sprouting to harvest compared to what the seed packet said. And those can give you some feedback as to whether you're 
doing well or maybe you need to work on your fertilizing habits or, or something if, if you're relatively slow or it may just be an indication of, of that year's climate and, and so having a way to keep records uh, that you can come back to is, is pretty valuable in that regard. Um, I've, until, until I got my book, which I got for Christmas and I was pretty excited about it, I, I had another method and, and I have a, a blog on the internet and, and so I started a garden blog on the internet and I can take a picture with my cell phone and type a couple words about what it, what it is and then send it as an email and it posts it right to the blog and that's the way I did all my journaling until I got this. And I must say, it's been very valuable. I've gone back to it many times. So, for example, when, when I finished filling my compost bin and sealed it up for now start to fill the other one, and then now all of a sudden the other one's full, and I think, when did I finish? How long has it been? Go back in my blog and I can see, oh, that was 63 days ago. Uh, so, so those kinds of things have been valuable, and, and the, the blog was quite simple to use. This is simple to use too, it's just a different form and it's going to have a, a lot of history. It, I, I'm really looking forward to having years of history. So, different ways to do it, but the key is to do some sort of journaling if you want to learn from your results, and I think, uh, I think we all benefit from that. So how often haven't we said, I'm going to remember that? <laughs> And um, the uh, I have been using that same journal um, that Rob has. And my, I'm on my fourth or fifth year now. So if you want to see read all about my garden failures, I have the book right up here for you to look at. <laughs> okay, then. Ultimately, the point of this is that we want to enjoy. And we want to... Um, enjoy having our neighbors enjoy it and all of the other people that we know enjoy it um, that's the purpose of the endeavor <laughs>